Hey boys and girls, I wanted to do a quick review on how to make graphs in science. Uh, some of you didn't do as well as you probably would have hoped on the Heart Lab because you made some mistakes in making creating your graph. Uh, I think we were using the Numbers app a lot this year and you were just having to put your numbers into a data table and then numbers would create the graph for you. But it's important that you know how to do this yourself. Um, so some of you may need some sort of a, a refresher on how to do that. So we're just going to go over some things quickly. The PowerPoint that I am referring to is in um, the folder, the reassessment folder, so you can refer to this again when you're creating the graph. So the first sort of graph is a pie chart. A pie chart is for percents of a whole. So if you're looking for what percentage of people um, um, voted for Annie for president of student council and what percentage of people voted for Joey for president of student council. You can do that if you want to just find out percentage of parts of a whole, all right? And that would be uh, your pie chart. Uh, bar graph. Bar graph is what we use a lot in science, at least in seventh grade science. So when you're wanting to compare, so when you're getting results from a lab, for example, our heart lab, and you have different results um, of, in this case, your uh, beats per minute, your heart rate, depending on the activity, you're comparing those different activities. So you would, you should have used a bar graph. Okay, so um, that's, and again, that is the graph that we use the most in uh, seventh grade science. Then we have a line graph that is change over time. Uh, so if you're looking for uh, a pattern, so if you're wanting to predict what the next step would be, so if something is happening and you're saying, well, it looks like uh, it's trending upwards or trending downwards, then you would use a line graph. And then a scatter plot looks at correlation. So how does one thing affect another? And then you would put all these dots on um, data points on a graph, and you would get your best fit line. So for our purposes, we are going to be talking about uh, how to label graphs and specifically um, line graphs and bar graphs. So uh, a very helpful mnemonic to use, a mnemonic is a mnemonic device, is something that helps you remember the steps of something. Um, and that first mnemonic is called TAILS. And TAILS, uh, the T is title, A is axis, I is interval, L is legend, and S is scale. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the title. Your teacher or whoever is looking at your graph should be able to tell right away what your graph's going to be about by looking at the title. You're not just going to write heart lab or M&M lab or frog lab. You need to be very specific about what happened in that lab so that they can look at the data and right away uh, it starts to tell them a story. So remember, your title needs to tell whoever's looking at your graph exactly what the graph was about ideally including the independent and dependent variables. The next is label the axes. So, and put the data on the correct axis, right? So, um, another mnemonic that we use is dry mix, um, and that's coming up at the end of this presentation, but DRY, dependent or responding variable, goes on the Y axis, and MIX, the manipulated or the independent variable, goes on the X axis. So remember, the independent variable is what you change. You change, um, I'm gonna skip ahead, the, um, the independent variable. So um, it is independent of anything else, and as you as the scientist, what did you change? And that is on the X axis, because that's the independent variable. And then we have the dependent variable, which goes on the Y. So what changes as a result of the independent variable? And that goes on the Y axis. So in the heart lab that we did, we had the activities on the X because that's what we changed. Um, your teacher said, okay, now do the jumping jacks, or now you're gonna listen to music, or now you're gonna hold your breath. Those are what we had control over. What we didn't have control over was the heart rate. So the heart rate went on the y-axis because the heart rate changed as a result of the activities that you were doing. 
okay? So that's the X and Y axis. So make sure you put them on the correct axis and that you label them. So you would have to say, even though you put on the X, jumping jacks, calm music, whatever, you have to put underneath activities, all right? So make sure that you give it a label. And then on the Y, for the heart lab, you should have written beats per minute or our heart rate and then beats per minute. You always have to put the unit of measure, okay? Um, you can't, for example, if you were measuring something or getting, um, uh, yeah, measuring like the length of something or like the ounces, no, oh gosh, I just said ounces, the um, grams of something, you would have to say, if you put the numbers on the Y, you would have to say in grams, okay? So always remember the unit of measure. Okay, so the next is intervals. So the interval is the space between each line, and it has to increase the same amount, okay? So uh, for our heart lab, first of all, it always starts at zero. You never put your first number at the apex, which is where it meets like this. You never put your first number there. You always put your first number at the first line. And unless you do that jaggedy sort of thing, and I know it has a math name, I don't know what it is, you can't start at 60 and then go to 70, 80, 90, 100. If you start at 60, your next number has to be 120, 180. Okay, so if you start it at whatever number you start at is your interval, unless you put, like I said, that jaggedy line, which I know has a fancy name. I don't remember what it is. So how do you determine your interval? Well, you look at your biggest number, on your data set and then you're you need to create a graph that will give you enough room to go from zero to that biggest number so if your biggest number is 110 your interval you need to count how much space you have on your graph you might be able to go by fives if it's a big piece of paper you might have to go by tens if you only have 11 or 12 lines on your graph so you have to decide what is your biggest number because then your, um, your scale will be zero to whatever that is, 110. Um, and then you have to figure out how many lines you have available. And then you're going to have to divide it out. But you can't do 10, 20, 30, 50, 80, 105. Okay, you have to go by even intervals. The next thing is scale. So the importance of the scale is how much space you take up on that um, in the space that you're given so you're not going to smush all of your data over into one corner you want to spread it out evenly also leaving the exact same space in between each bar so for example you did a bar graph and you can see on the example right here that these bars there's a bar then a space then a bar then a space then a bar then a space they use the whole area and they left the same amount of space in between each one. You should use at least 75% of the space that you're given. Don't jam all of your data over into one little corner. It makes it very hard um, for the person who's looking at your graph to see what you've written. So I'm gonna go back here. So that's scale, okay? And then L stands for legend. So do you need some sort of a key? Uh, if you didn't label the activities on the heart lab, um, and you just put colors up in the corner, you could say green is resting, um, pink was jumping jacks, blue was whatever. Okay, but you have to have some sort of a legend. Um, so there's all of it all together. Uh, remember, use about seven, at least 75% of the space. Um, and then here's the dry mix. So your dependent goes on the y-axis, uh, independent goes on the X, uh, and make sure that you review this presentation uh, before creating uh, your own graph.